I am John Marshall. I am Chief of Hematology Oncology at MedStar and Georgetown University Hospital, as well as the Director of the Otto J. Rusch Center for the Cure of GI Cancers. So mostly my patients are young and old and men and women, but they all have a GI cancer, so that is colorectal cancers and pancreas cancers and stomach cancers and others, some liver cancers and bile duct cancers and things called cholangiocarcinomas and neuroendocrine cancers, but it all falls under the category of GI cancer. If you actually look at it, there are more patients with GI cancer, most common and unfortunately most fatal cancers on the planet. It's an incredible public health problem that does not get the kind of attention that it needs. And our group here at MedStar has the most experienced team of doctors to manage the GI cancers. Everyone out there says that their cancer center is comprehensive. It is a buzzword uh, that's used for small hospitals, big hospitals, and everyone alike. The definition comes from the National Cancer Institute. To be designated an NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center is the highest level that the NCI bestows. We compete, we obtain a grant, and we are one of them and have been one for a long, long time. Cancer care is a complicated thing. It's not just one doctor, it's not just one visit. It becomes your life. Cancer is a life-changing moment for almost everybody who experiences it. And all across the city, our team is concentrated in places like Georgetown Hospital, but is also going out to the community. So in essence, any door you enter into the MedStar network, you're encountering the same level of expertise, the same high quality care that you would get if you come to Lombardi's Comprehensive Cancer Center here at Georgetown. We are one and the same. You need this level of care because you need expertise, not only as an oncologist, all I do is GI cancer, but you need the same in a surgeon. All they do is GI cancer surgery or radiation. All they do is GI cancer radiation for the team, for those patients. Same is true for breast cancer. Same is true for lung cancer. Same is true for prostate cancer. Separate teams, multidisciplinary teams, experts in their field for each of the different cancers. So why would you go anywhere else? All across the country, there are what we call healthcare systems. And so hospitals buy other hospitals and they merge and they join. And Washington, D.C. is no different. In our region, we have joined a group called MedStar. And MedStar has just done a fabulous job of establishing practice standards throughout our community. And so the question always within a system is do you have different kinds of physicians out in certain hospitals um, or do you have the same high quality throughout your network? And so within MedStar we've made an early decision that whether you walk in to see one of us at MedStar Montgomery General in Olney, Maryland, a lovely little hospital out there, or you fight the traffic in Key Bridge and you get into our parking lot and see us here at Georgetown downtown, that you're going to get the same level of care, the same expertise, no matter where you walk in. And that's what distinguishes our network from other networks that you hear about. And so around cancer, this is fundamental to us. We want you to see a disease-specific expert, team of experts, no matter where you walk in to our system. We want you to have the same access to the best imaging, scans and MRIs, the best pathology and molecular profiling, the best access to clinical research. Whether you walk into MedStar, um, Washington Hospital Center, Lombardi, St. Mary's, wherever. And that's our goal around our system and we think we're meeting that goal. Cancer is complicated. It affects how you feel. It affects your head, your brain, how you think. It disrupts your normal life. 
you need a bunch of different doctors. You need an oncologist, you need a surgeon, you need a radiation oncologist sometimes. You need a lung doctor, a GI doctor, you know, you need a team. And if you had to go through the buffet and say, I'm going to see this doctor here and this doctor there and this doctor there, and they're not coordinated, they're not used to working as a team, then it's not as good. It's just the care is not as good. So enrolling in a clinical trial, some people think, oh, why would I bother doing that? Or that seems riskier. I'll get a placebo or something like that. Well, first off, why would you do standard of care? I could equally argue that why would you do that? There's no question standard of care is getting better. Um, but we know what standard of care can and cannot do. There are many shortcomings to standard of care. So we always know we need to move the bar. And what we try to do here is offer every patient who comes here not only standard of care, but an alternative option to participate in clinical research. Yes, it's a collective effort. We help each other by doing that. But we ask no patient to participate in clinical research that wouldn't potentially benefit them. Right? And so it's, it's an important part of our collaborative to engage folks in clinical research, offer them the best clinical trial that there is out there, and if they want to participate, we're delighted to have them. So patients are often wondering when is the right time to go into a clinical trial. We often will hear things, well, am I ready for that yet? Because I think a lot of folks equate clinical research with running out of options, right? But the reality is at every step of the way, there's an opportunity to improve how we do things, to make better treatments, to uncover better therapies. And so quite honestly, Almost everyone is eligible for a clinical trial. It turns out no two cancers are alike. And that's maybe scary, right? We've been treating them as if they're all one kind of thing, that all colon cancers are the same, all pancreas cancers are the same. But maybe a little like snowflakes, there's no two that are the same. And they're different in that they have different gene mutations. There are some common overlapping gene mutations, and they're very important for us to understand those. But what we're beginning to understand is other gene mutations. We're beginning to measure not just one or two gene mutations, but the entire gene sequence of a tumor. Beyond that, not just the genes, but the proteins that come from those genes, they vary as well. So the more we look, the more we find differences and complexity in an individual's tumor. And until we can separate a patient into this what we call personal or precision medicine, right? that your cancer is different than your cancer and I'm going to treat you differently than I would treat this patient, that's how we're going to cure this disease. And so here within MedStar and our cancer network, we have formed a, a very tight partnership with a group called Keras. Keras does extensive molecular profiling. And so our patients in this center have the opportunity to participate in this, where we get extensive deep profiling on tumors in a way that we can help understand how these gene mutations apply to an individual. Does it tell me your cancer is a good cancer or a bad cancer? Does it tell me that this treatment will work better than that treatment? All of those things are possible from this. This has to also be coupled with what we call big data, right? The fancy word bioinformatics. So we have all of these gene mutations, but we need to sort through them and compare and contrast. And we're really pleased to have one of the world's leading groups in bioinformatics here at the university. And so you put that together with leading experts in the clinical side, with leading experts on the university side to bring this molecular profiling story back together. It's the only way we're going to cure these complex cancers, um, and we're piloting it in our GI cancer patients throughout the network. So today, almost every patient with cancer 
we don't just use a microscope to tell them what's going on. We don't just say, oh, that's cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Almost every kind of cancer, we do a more personal dive to understand some of the molecular subtypes of cancer. The most famous of these are in breast cancer where we do HER2 and ERPR. These are hormone receptors. But in colorectal cancer, we've got our own target called RAS. And what, if you have a particular RAS mutation, drugs work uh, or don't work. And if you don't have the mutation, they're much more likely to work. So we're figuring out on the micro level, on the individual level, who should get what kind of treatment and who shouldn't. This also plays into inherited cancer syndromes. We're learning more and more about how to test a patient or a patient's tumor to understand if this is something running in the family or if this is something that just randomly popped up in that individual. And so those key elements are so important in managing any patient and that is routine here and within our network. Genetic testing for your cancer is pretty routine now. So it should be an expectation of every patient walking into almost any doctor's office, quite honestly. It's the extent of the genetic testing. It's the understanding the results, which I think will distinguish the docs within our system uh, from others. More and more genetic testing is critical. Part of the core understanding of how to take care of a patient, whether it's a prognosis issue or what drugs we should give you uh, in the treatment of that disease. So genetic testing is fundamental to what we do day in and day out. Um, and it is how we're going to make major breakthroughs going forward. Almost everyone today will have some kind of genetic testing on their cancer. There are a few exceptions where we don't know about genetic testing or it's not part of the core process, but almost everybody today will have some kind of genetic test on their tumor. So whether you see one of us at MedStar Montgomery General, one of the outlying hospitals or one of the main you know, core hospitals, you will have access to genetic testing. We talk about different kinds of treatments for cancer. The main one people think about is chemotherapy. But then there's this other branches around what we call targeted therapy and there's also immunotherapy that's emerging. And frankly, I think sometimes the distinctions are a little blurry. Chemotherapy has a target, but it's a little less focused, if you will. It damages normal cells as well. Targeted therapy, at least at its beginnings, was, okay, so you have a mutation in a particular cancer. Some accelerator in the cell is stuck on the on position. Can I shoot my medicine just at that gene, just at that protein, and clip it, and therefore not really hurt other cells? And there have been great examples of highly successful targeted therapy. A drug called Herceptin or Trastuzumab in breast cancer. A drug called Gleevec for GI stromal tumors and chronic myelogenous leukemias. These cancers have genes that are broken that is the main reason why they're cancer, why the cells have behaved like a cancer. You give these medicines and it fixes it. It's fabulous, right? The problem is, is that for a lot of cancers, there's a bunch of broken genes. And yes, you can hit one target, but there are other targets that are broken. Also, some of the other targets are on normal cells. And so when you hit them, there is collateral damage. So part of the reason why we're doing more and more gene testing is to find more and more targets. It turns out it's pretty easy to target, make a drug against a target. The problem is our cancers are complex. It's not just one target causing the cancer, one pathway causing the cancer. It's multiple. So as we are going forward, we realize that yes, chemo is still going to be needed. 
combining it with one or more targeted therapies is sort of where we're headed. And the hope is that when we find the right patient, the right target, the right mix of chemotherapy, that we have a much more dramatic impact on their cancers, as well as reducing the overall side effect for patients. Better outcome, lower side effect, that's the goal. So the, one of the other major, really incredible new areas of research is called immunotherapy. And there have been skeptics for decades that how could we, in fact, turn our immune system on or off to fight cancer. Many people believed that cancers occurred because our immune systems were broken. Well, it turns out that's not true at all. What turns out is our immune systems absolutely see our cancers. They recognize it, they make T cells against it, but the problem is that we can't rev the immune system up enough to treat a big tumor. We're better at treating small cells, fewer cells, this sort of thing. The biggest discovery, and people are seeing it in the newspaper and on TV and the like, is that we've discovered a new branch of immune therapy. It's kind of a corny way of looking at it, but it's sort of as if tumors put up a force field to prevent the immune system from coming in and getting it. And if we now have developed medicines that are called checkpoint inhibitors that actually can kind of block, take out the force field. And so the immune cells that were ready to go, that weren't able to get into the cancer, now can get to the cancer. And so just by taking out the force field, we're seeing dramatic impact in treating cancers. The best impact we've seen is in uh, skin cancer, melanoma. We also see positive impact in lung cancers and kidney cancers. We're making inroads into some of the other cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreas cancers, and others, where we're using these checkpoint inhibitors in combination with vaccines to try and treat these cancers. Very hot area of research. Um, maybe that this decade will be the decade of immune therapy for cancer. Our hope is that what the last decade of targeted therapy becomes the decade of immune therapy and we begin to see significant improvement in outcomes including cures by simply tweaking one's immune system. So chemotherapy are drugs which generally target cell division. So in order for a cancer to grow, one cell has to split into two. That's how it works if you flash back to your biology class. And in order to do that, you have to have a new set of DNA and all sorts of things that have to be made to make the new cell. Well, chemo undermines that process. Um, it can mess with the DNA, it can mess with the stuff that has to move around in cells, but it hits dividing cells. And of course, cancers are rapidly dividing for the most part, so that's how chemo works. But of course, there's normal cells that are dividing. My hair, my bone marrow, my lining of my GI tract, constantly dividing as well. So the side effects of chemotherapy hit normal cells that also depend on division. And so that's the difference, but we cannot really undermine the importance of chemotherapy. Let's face it, chemotherapy cures a lot of people. It cures testicular cancers. It cures kids with cancers. It adds to the cure rate after surgery in colon cancer and lung cancer and breast cancer and the like. So it's an important treatment that's out there. And while we are all a glitter about immunotherapy and targeted therapy, we're not going to get rid of chemotherapy. We're better at chemotherapy. Our side effects are better. We understand better how to manage the nausea, the fatigue, and the, all the pieces that come with that. But it still has collateral damage. Part of what we're also recognizing is that we're curing more people. And so the impact of that chemotherapy or whatever treatment it was downstream matters more and more. So we're being less heavy-handed with our chemotherapy. We're not using as much chemo. We're not trying to be aggressive. We're trying to be effective. And so we're using less. We're 
you know, and so we're re reducing the long-term consequences that patients have from their treatment. Use the treatment, stop it, manage the side effects. That's where we are today. The side effects of immunotherapy are kind of interesting. So in some cases, they're, they're almost none. Vaccines, it's like you get a vaccine, you're sore in the arm for a while and that's it. Maybe a little fever. But on the other hand, Sometimes if you release the brakes on the immune system, then all of a sudden you develop autoimmunity, right? So your immune system is turning on normal things as well, like your skin. So you can get what's called vitiligo. You can get rashes. You can get diarrhea. So when the immune system gets, if you will, way out of control with no break on it at all, you can develop autoimmunity. And that really today is the most serious side effect of the new immune therapies. Every cancer has a stage, and generally it's one to four, although some cancers have some quirks around different staging systems. It's basically trying to categorize patients according to how extensive their cancer is. How far along is it? How bad is it when it starts? And most cancers start at stage one, the worst being stage four. In stage four, what that means is the cancer has spread to some other organ, or it's pretty far along. Um, usually thought to be incurable, although that's not 100% true either. Stage 1s usually are fixed. If you can identify an early stage cancer, you usually fix those pretty straightforward. Stage 2s and 3s for most cancers are ones where, yes, you need some surgery, you might need some radiation, but you also might need some chemotherapy in order to cure, and so often fall into the most controversial groups of how to manage and the like. So, Every patient should know their stage. Um, it's part of sort of the core information about it. We're getting more away from that, though. Stage is based on a microscope. It's based on anatomy. Where is the tumor? More and more, we're shifting over to molecular profiling. Okay, so maybe you have a stage 3, but if you have a stage 3 and you have X, Y, and G gene abnormality, that makes it better or worse and the like. So more and more we're mixing the anatomy of the cancer with the molecular profile of the cancer to get us smarter about that individual patient's cancer. GI cancers are terrible. They're common. Lots of people have them, but you don't talk about it at a cocktail party. You don't share information about it. There's not very much funding for research out there, even though they are collectively the most common cancers on the planet. We recognize this problem here at Georgetown, and we were so fortunate to have a partner of the Roosh family, but not for a good reason. So Otto Roosh, gets pancreas cancer. And like so many people with pancreas cancer dies of his disease. His wife and his family, who have been long-term partners with us here at Georgetown and at MedStar, said we have to change this. And they had the wherewithal to support our center, to get us started, to focus on GI cancers as a group, to advocate on the Hill and social media, to convene groups together to work together as a team to improve the outcome for GI cancer, whether it's patient awareness and screening, or for us, really importantly, providing support for clinical research out there. And so the Roosh Center is totally focused on curing GI cancers. When we first started the center, people said, oh, you can't use the C word, cure word, in your center, that's, yeah, it's crazy. How come the breast cancer people can race for the cure and we can't? And I said, no, it's in there. We're gonna put the C word in our title because if you ask patients what they want, they want to be cured. Sure, they'll take an extra six months, but they want to be cured. And so our focus is to walk the walk, to partner with our patients, to offer them innovative, personalized translational research, to work together as a multidisciplinary team, to store their blood and their tumors, to build a big haystack so we can find the needles, 
and we have an incredible partnership with our patients. We have thousands of patients who've participated in our programs um, and who've given us tubes of blood and allowed us to mine their data so that we can figure out why this patient did well and this patient didn't do well. We have high participation in clinical research. We work with our local advocacy groups to try and pull them together, whether it's 5K runs to raise some money or to go to their meetings and teach them about their disease and clinical research. We host uh, a great symposium supported by MedStar. We have it three times a year around through the community where we invite our patients to come and share in not only the science but the other important parts of cancer care. That's the Rouge Center.